Okay, it's okay. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, my name is Angela Schellig. I'm an associate professor at the University of Toronto and have been in Canada for the past nine and a half years and recently took um, a Humboldt professorship at TU Munich. So um, we'll have some international collaborations between Toronto and Munich. I do still hear some echo here. I'm not sure if I can avoid this. I think it's my own. But I, I can still hear. It's just a mic. I think. Oh, it's just a mic. Okay. Let's hope. Okay. I hope you can all understand me well. So, um, yeah. So, if you're excited about um, machine learning and robotics, one key thing to consider is how to safely learn and reliably learn on real hardware. And that motivated us to um, develop Safe Control Chip, a unified benchmark suite for safe learning based control and reinforcement learning. So let me start in a nutshell, what is Safe Control Gym and how did we, and why did we build it? So the majority of today's robots, uh, if we are honest, are controlled by model-based control designs and hand-tuned and, um, you know, um, controller parameters are hand-tuned. And we should give some credit to the controls community and that also motivates some of why we developed this um, environment. So, you know, in, in this traditional setup, we usually try to understand the system or the robot with a mathematical model and then design a controller to achieve a desired closed loop behavior. And this has been extremely successful. 99.9% of all robots run based on this kind of setup. But the motivation for us is that we envision robots you know, in the future where they operate in our human-centered environments and not behind factory walls. Robots are envisioned to navigate our roads and skies, support us in our daily tasks, and interact with us in the workplace. And all these applications, you know, suffer from large prior uncertainties. We don't necessarily know the weather. We don't necessarily know the preference of preferences of the human or the exact objects they should interact with. But we still you know, expect robots to perform in a safe and high performance manner. So in this transition from kind of factory floors to our human-centered environments, um, what, what changes is the complexity of the robot designs, often you know, we have more complex, we, we aim for more complex robot designs, possibly soft robots, multi-robot systems. The complexity of the environment changes from static and unstructured environments to dynamic and un, uh, from static and structured environments to dynamic and unstructured environments. And the complexity of the surfaces or tasks may change from simple motions to complex interactive tasks. And so this transition motivates us all to use machine learning to compensate for the lack of our own system understanding. Okay. Um, so we are not as good anymore at, at modeling and predicting the behavior of the robots in those new application areas. But there are still some key features that we wanted to reflect in our software environment. And one being that we still have a lot of useful prior information and data can be cost and or time expensive to collect um, in robotics applications compared to, for example, standard machine learning applications such as um, image understanding or natural language processing. Then disturbances and noise cannot be neglected. Many of the current RL environments that people use don't have noise embedded or, 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 or clear ways to have repeatable disturbances. And the third point is safety and constraint satisfaction. So if you look at the robot on the right, um, 
either during learning, but for sure after learning, we want robots to be safe. And safe can mean that a flying vehicle doesn't fall out of the sky, or it can mean, you know, that a robot doesn't fall like, like you see here on the right. And so these kind of We, we tried to bring this into our safe control gym environment. So we created this environment as a simulation environment with an emphasis on model-based control. So the traditional way of controlling should be possible in this environment as well. And the traditional way of controlling a robot is based on physics models. And so we wanted to reflect this. It would be only fair to compare you know, the latest, greatest RL agents to traditional control, tra controllers and see how well they do. And so the second point is we wanted to be able to learn uncertain dynamics um, and, uh, you know, and have ways to incorporate uncertainty in the environment. And we wanted to study the robustness and constraint satisfaction or safety. And so on the right, you see in this image, um, one, one environment we have is the standard inverted pendulum because th that is broadly used um, in learning. And so you can change, for example, the length of the pendulum or you can specify models with symbolic um, toolboxes. And so the current environments we have is a carpool, a 1D quadrotor, and a 2D quadrotor. So 1D quadrotor is up and down, and 2D is, is moving in a plane. Um, ideally, we want to expand this, but that's where we are right now. And you can find the, the repo on GitHub um, on the Safe Control Gym, if you're interested. We developed it with PyBullet, PyTorch, and Cassidy. So Cassidy is used for the symbolic um, models. It also has a nice configuration system such that you can quickly code up reproducible experiments and test the same controllers and learners with exactly the same kind of noise characteristics or disturbances. So overall, as a first summary, basically, this environment augments the standard gym environment with symbolic models to also be able to compare against um, traditional model-based approaches. It um, includes constraint specification, such that safety properties of controllers can be studied during and after learning. And it has a formal way to inject disturbances. To date, we have implemented a couple of baseline controllers from both you know, the traditional controls field as well as the emerging safe learning based control approaches. And we also implemented a few traditional RL agents as well as safe, um, safe and robust RL approaches that have been recently proposed. So here you see a list. These are all abbreviations. I don't expect them to, you to know them all, but for example, you see LQR for linear quadratic regular, the very standard approach for linear model predictive control, linear MPC, and then also other RL standard approaches such as PPO. And, um, and really the hope is that this environment allows you to easily benchmark um, across a few characteristics such as performance and data efficiency of approaches, um, safety and constraint satisfaction, and how well approaches do during and after learning, and robustness towards model uncertainties. And so for, just as an example, you can ask if we incorporate prior, wrong prior model information into, my, into a controller, is that overall um, worse than not incorporating any information? Or do we still save data, right? Can we still be more data efficient just by incorporating simple but um, partially wrong model? And so these type of comparisons are possible, of course. You know, this is a big team effort, and um, you see the team members here. It's Lukas Kuhnke, um, first 
second year PhD, Justin Yuan, Jacopo Panerati, Melissa Grave, Tiki Su, and Adam Hall. A few of them are here today, and um, maybe you can briefly raise your hand. Yeah, right here. So if you have more questions, um, you can contact them later. So what is the state of the art in safe robot learning, and what motivated the features of safe control gym? So how we got started with all of this is because we started to prepare a large um, review paper or survey paper on safe learning and robotics. And this paper is available on archive. Um, it has been published in the annual reviews for control and robotics. And the key takeaway there was the field is really driven by both the controls community and the reinforcement learning community. And efforts on both sides have been increasing over the past five years. And we try to unify the language of those two communities to kind of enable um, an understanding and enable, um, I guess, cross, um, cross disciplinary approaches. And so in the broadest sense, both in the controls community and in the machine learning uh, controls community and the reinforcement learning community, you can pose this problem of safe robot learning as a safe decision-making problem under uncertainties, where you minimize some cost function or maximize some reward, um, depending which field you are in, a subject to the true dynamics of the robot. So you want to you know, the reward represents your task subject to the dynamics of the true robot. Um, you may have some safety constraints and some initial condition. And so the key features are there's a system model describing the system behavior. You may know this or you may not know this ahead of time, um, but there's an underlying dynamic behavior. Um, there is a cost function that describes the task which is denoted here by J. And there are some constraints, safety constraints, actuation constraints um, that are important for a reliable and safe behavior in robotics. And so these constraints overall in the literature these days um, come at three, in three different levels. Soft constraints are often found in the RL literature. They basically encourage safety. So they encourage not, you know, not violating this gray shaded, not moving into this gray shaded area. Then there is probabilistic constraints, which with high probability guarantee that you do not um, violate the constraints using usually probabilistic machine learning models such as Gaussian processes. And then there are hard constraints so approaches that guarantee under some assumptions that you do not violate the constraints. So all these different type levels of safety constraints can be embedded in this general formulation. And in this general formulation, any of the components could be partially unknown. We may not know exactly how the robot moves. So the F um, of the dynamics may be unknown. Um, the, the task, like the cost may be partially unknown. So all of these can be partially unknown. And to unify the communities, you can view the safe learning control problem as a mapping from prior knowledge, any prior knowledge you have about J, F, and C, the constraints, to end the data you collected to the best possible policy that, in, as you formulated here, minimizes J. So it's kind of a mapping from prior knowledge and data to the best policy. And that captures the fact, you know, that traditional control uses purely prior information usually, and RL uses purely data, but then there are lots of approaches that sit somewhere in the middle. And so that, that problem formulation really drove the setup in safe control gym. So we have, you know, symbolic prior knowledge that you can define. Um, you, we, you, we have a way to um, incorporate safety constraints and define constraints. And we have a way to inject disturbances. 
and process noise for some additive dynamics. And so again, just to kind of recap what we found in the, in the literature, um, the key approaches right now in this area can be kind of put in, roughly speaking, in this coordinate frame, where the x-axis represents how much we know about the dynamics of the robot. So left is we fully understand the behavior, so known dynamics. On the right is unknown dynamics. And in the middle is we may have an understanding of the structure of the dynamics, but we may not know all the parameters. So we may not know if some of the inertia parameters of the robot. And then on the y-axis is the increasing safety levels. So sometimes we, we design controllers, but we cannot give any guarantees if they work or not. Um, and you know, the highest level is hard constraints, as, as I showed. And so if we map today's approaches in this coordinate frame, you know, um, standard control approaches fall in, in this category here, three here to the left. So they work with known dynamics. And known dynamics could be a prior model plus. Um, known uncertainty bounds, but then control, standard control approaches can give you hard um, guarantees for safety under, under the assumption that you know the dynamics. RL more lies in this part, so it usually makes very little assumptions about the dynamics and the underlying processes but also doesn't usually give any guarantees. And then in the literature, um, oh yeah, and here you see one of the examples, right? It's very impressive, but you don't see that, you know, for the majority of times this cube actually falls and it's not successful. Um, and so in the literature now, we see a few different approaches. We categorize them in the following way. So, one is safely learning the uncertain dynamics. So this, this part is more driven by the, or this body of work is more driven by the controls community and um, usually can give you probabilistic guarantees. Then there are approaches from the reinforcement lear learning community encouraging safety and robustness. And they usually um, just, just encourage safety. Um, there's interesting approaches that combine or try to safety certify um, RL approaches and so with safety filters. So they basically add a safety filter to the output of an RL agent and the safety filter tries to guarantee safety of the overall system. And so these three categorizes is really what we saw in the literature today. Um, where we really want to go is up there, right? We want to work with the most complex systems and still guarantee that they are safe during or at least after learning. And so, yeah, we, we observe those three categories. Um, if you go to the review paper, you also see a section on all the open challenges. There are many, many. <laughs> so um, it's definitely a field of research where we need all your help. Um, what we also saw is how or checked and carefully looked is how are these, these approaches evaluated in the papers. And so we distinguished numerical examples, and you know, these are grid worlds or very simple examples that don't yet resemble anything that, that could be called a robot. And so um, you see the different categories at the bottom. So the, the learning-based control approaches use those numerical examples 40% of the time, 46% of the time, the safety filters don't use as simple of systems. Then we, the second category we looked at is, or, and we found in the literature is robot simulators and physics-based environments. And so you see, increasing use of those environments, especially for the service safety certification, and then robot, real robot experiments. But real robot experiments basically are only shown in one third of the papers. And then most dramatically, if you look at how many of those works are open source, 
open source code is available and it's it's very few um, papers do have that that really makes comparisons difficult so comparisons across these different <coughs> methods um, are made difficult because first they are evaluated on numerical examples robot simulators and real experiments and usually not two of them just either people decide to go to a real experiment or they stick with numerical examples and then they don't the code is often not made available and so that really you know uh, convinced us that something has to be done and something has to be done to kind of bring these two fields together because both of them publish a lot in this area, but it's hard to follow and compare. And, and the particular challenges for benchmarking are that safe learning based control and safe RL have been mostly used for different tasks. So different communities look at different tasks. Different communities also make different prior assumptions. As, as I showed you, a really small percentage of all work has open source code available. So you see here, right, no and yes, it's less than 25%. And then also, in terms of metrics, every paper uses different metrics to show, um, show the efficiency and safety of their approaches. And experimental evaluations are rare. And if they are done, they are differing widely in terms of the platforms used. And so, you know, this is this is some work from, from my group where we automatically tune in a safe manner, a PID controller, PD controller. So that's on a quadruple and the stabilization task. This is again from our group. So yeah, you know, not better than anyone else. We, we try on an off-road vehicle for one of the approaches. And you know, this is another safe navigation paper in a completely different environment, um, navigating in an office environment. So this really motivated us to think about, can we create an environment where people can at least, as one of their evaluation strategies, um, evaluate the algorithm and easily compare them to existing algorithms. So let's dive a bit deeper into what safe control gym is. So it's an open source, it's based on an open source physics engine, um, high bullet. It's compatible with the open AI gym interface. So other RL agents can be plugged in, um, such as the stable um, baseline three. And for the symbolic framework, we use Cassidy. And so that's really important to make this attractive to controls researchers who often use prior models. Um, then we have two tasks, um, stabilization and trajectory tracking right now. Again, we try to you know, at least make the simplest things work first. Um, there's lots of potential to expand this in the future, but the stabilization and trajectory tracking are the two tasks. And there's a configuration system based on YAML that you can kind of um, uh, do reproducible and portable experiments. And we, as I mentioned before, we have the two platforms right now, and those are the inverted pendulum on a cart and a quadruple. And we choose them because they are simple, and you know, um, it, at least from what we've seen in the past is that simple environments still get more adoption than going to a complicated right away. Um, and these environments are also used in both communities, in the controls and the RL community. Um, so we, stuck with, yeah, we, we decided to use those as a first step. The overall architecture looks like this. Um, so we have on the left the controllers that you can implement and on the right is the environment and the key thing is that you have the symbolic models here, you have the constraints, you see in the blue boxes, and you have the dynamic disturbances and the input and estimation disturbances. So to go into a bit more detail, it follows the GIMP API for the agent environment interaction loop. 
but it provides additional information for symphonic optimization and safe learning. And so here at this interface between controller and environment, he can return additional information in both directions. So he can communicate prior models from the environment to the controller, and the controller can communicate, for example, constraint violations back. Then it supports common utilities for safe learning-based control. And the key here is that the environment is augmented with the symbolic models, the constraints specifications, and the disturbance specifications. And you can specify this all in these YAML files and then you know, run the probabilistic setup um, exactly in the same way under multiple different controllers. And finally, we have, you know, at this point, a number of control baselines. So hopefully, if you use this to test your controller, um, it's like an easy feat to compare to other controllers. And here's here's the list. So um, yeah, you you basically have some of the most standard um, RL agents and. Um, model based controllers, as well as some of these state of the art safe learning approaches to compare to. And so you can easily swap those in um, on the controller side, as well as swap anything other frameworks such as state of baseline screen, because the interface is you know, um, following the gym structure. Okay, so let's see how safe control can be used. Um, how have we been using it? And what are the approaches that we implemented as baseline approaches um, operating in this framework? So here are a few examples. So the first one is, you know, a standard PID controller. Yeah, the, the PID controller is here on the left, right, um, as a controller. And a PID controller doesn't require any, any constraints, so it doesn't use those, or cannot explicitly account for any constraints, so it doesn't use those. And it's, it's doing this here on this 2, 2D quadrilateral um, task. Another standard control approach that has nothing yet to do with learning is robust model predictive control. In robust model predictive control, you the setup is as follows: you have a robot that should follow a path. You have constraints to consider. For example, it shouldn't violate those path bounds. It relies on predictions to make decision, optimal decisions. And how it accounts for mismatch between the model and the real world is by assuming a maximum bound, so a maximum, mount, a maximum model mismatch. And so you see on the diagram at the bottom right, so we have a robust MPC approach. It now explicitly takes into account the constraints of the environment, um, and it takes into account a model. And so how does it do that? So in, in a standard robust model predictive control framework, you have a cost function you want to minimize, and you have a nominal model of the robot. And so that would come from the environment, right? Um, and then you also require the maximum possible model mismatch, and you use that to reduce your state and input constraints. So you basically say, even in the worst case, with a worst case model, um, I need to satisfy my state and input constraints. So I tighten the constraints such that even if my normal model is off, um, I will not actually leave the bounded, um, the bounded space. So it takes it, it assumes maximal, um, a maximum model mismatch. Because it does so, it basically optimizes for the worst case it's usually conservative. But so the dynamics, just to recap, the dynamics would live in the environment, the nominal dynamics, but then the maximum mismatch would live in the controller side because that is an assumption of the controller and it may be violated. 
in reality. They, these approaches have been extended to learning-based MPC, where the model mismatch here now on the left is learned over time using a Gaussian process. And so then we have here in the controller a probabilistic machine learning model, a Gaussian process, trying to learn the model mismatch, which is represented in the dynamics as F hat. And so it tries to learn this F hat over time. And as it learns it, it can optimize its performance um, for the real behavior. And so we have, again, still the prior model that, we, that is used in this, in this approach. And it learns this F hat. And the, the constraints are still narrow based on um, the probabilistic bounds from the Gaussian process. And so you see, for example, if we want to compare any RL algorithm to this type of approach, which has been very successful in, in control and also has been demonstrated on multiple real robots, we need to kind of specify a nominal model because that's really what this approach relies on. And so that's, that's why we need that in, in, in the safe control chip. Otherwise, there's no way to fairly compare or to compare. And so another, you know, if you go and look at a standard RL approach um, instead, um, we implemented PPO. And so there the controller is you know, a neural net, um, it has these trust region constraints, and it does the standard PPO um, um, update. And you can also make it robust. But so in this case, yeah, the, you know, it's a standard RL approach. It doesn't use the model information. It doesn't use the constraints and it's not able to incorporate those even so the environment has them. And, and we'll, we can still look at the performance of PPO and safe control chip and compare it, for example, to learning-based MPC. And then um, you can encourage robustness in this framework by um, randomizing, by using domain randomization. And you can also really nicely do that in this environment um, by randomizing the dynamics and learning with randomized dynamics and, um, and define a randomization space. And finally, this third category that I mentioned, where people um, define safety filters, um, the idea for those type of approaches is that you can have any non-constrained non learning-based controller that does not account for or is not able to incorporate constraints, but then the uncertified output of the learning-based controller, which is the uncertified input to the environment, is kind of passed through a safety filter. The safety filter certifies the, the input minimally modifies this input to make the overall control loops stable and safe. And so in this, these sets of approaches, you know, we have um, the model predictive safety um, certification on the controller side, which tries to minimally minim modify the input to make it safe. And then um, we have any type of RL agent that uses the cost function defined, given by the environment, which defines the task. And the, the certification, the safety filter still requires the dynamics model again. And so here the dynamics model from the environment is important again. And again, you know, um, there would be no way to um, run these controllers in the same framework if we wouldn't have a symbolic model in the environment, in the safe control gym environment. And then it does a simple, has a similar idea of reducing state of input constraints um, in a way to make this safe. So the constraints are explicitly considered in the safety filter. And so here you see this type of approach 
um, on the stabilization task of the car pole. And um, it's coupled with a non safe PPO um, RL agent. And so in the top right, what you see is the angle and the angular velocity of the inverted pendulum. And we constrain the angle. So we don't want the angle of the pendulum to go beyond certain bounds, which are the vertical lines. And the blue certified agents can do this versus the you know, red uncertified PPO would not um, satisfy those constraints and the pendulum would go beyond the desired um, range of angles. And then at the bottom, you see how the inputs are modified. So the blue is the filtered input to the environment, which is just slightly different, right? It, it only modifies it if, it if you come close to the constraints and, and you are close to um, violating the constraints, then the safety filter takes over and corrects the input. So this is just a few, so basically the, the core approaches that we saw and reviewed in our safe um, learning for robotics review paper um, can be implemented in this framework. So finally, this is maybe the most exciting, what kind of benchmarking may be possible with safe control gym? So it's really an ideal backdrop, back playground for both RL researchers and control theory people. And comparisons can be done on based on the learning performance, the learning efficiency, and the constraint satisfaction. And here's some examples like where we plotted in one coded frame um, in in a, as fair of a comparison as we could do um, the learning performance or the final performance on the 2D quadrotor task for a standard a model-based control approach such as a QR, um, but also the, the Gaussian process MPC approach that I showed you, the learning-based MPC and PPO in SAC. So just it's possible kind of to put this all in, in one component frame. The other one is on learning efficiency. I say a bit more about this in a second and constraint satisfaction. Again, I guess the main take home messages, we hear plug model-based control approaches, um, learning-based control approaches, um, safe T-filter approaches all in one corner frame. Um, and so to look at a few more details, so here you see left car pole stabilization on the right, the 2D quad rotor, and we, we can control the same robot platform for the same task with traditional learning based and RL approaches. And here you see the learned performance and the tracking error values. Um, and you know, right now we don't want to claim any superiority of one approach over the other. We just want to kind of say you can plot them in one corner frame actually and, and, and try to make fair comparisons. This I find really interesting. So here we compare data efficiency of different approaches. And so what you see on the x-axis is training data in seconds. So how much training data is used. And on the y-axis is the cost, which we want to minimize. So the, the cost function chain and or evaluation cost. And so if you look at a model-based learning approach such as GPMPC, which is blue, right? We get a really good performance with like magnitudes of data less than if we would use PPO or SSC. And so it's kind of on the one hand clear because it uses prior information, so it's not a totally fair comparison. This uh, model predictive control approach uses a prior model. But that prior model is a simple, inaccurate model. But you still see with a simple, inaccurate model, this approach I have, you know, um, it's two magnitudes of data, um, let's say it's two magnitudes of data compared to, uh, a, you know, a model free approach. And again, we don't want to show superiority, we just want to show you can compare this now and try 
to see based on, for example, the properties of your real experiment, which approach may be um, best suited. And then you can compare also the safety during and after training approach, training. And so on the left, for example, we have training data in seconds. Again, so basically the progress during learning. And then on the y-axis, the constraint violation, the number of constraint violations. And then on the, on the right, um, we have a plot where, where this is the two week quadrilateral. Um, and the dashed box shows the constraints in space and the different lines show different controller approaches and, and how they perform. And so for example, for this quadrilateral approach, a linear MPC with a linearized model um, would violate the constraints as well, right? Because it's a simple, Simplified model is partially wrong and it violates the, 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 the dash box. But these type of comparisons are possible. So here you see this type of experiment in the environment. And it, finally, you can also start studying the robustness of these approaches towards parameter uncertainties or other disturbances. And these again are just exemplar example plots. So here on the x-axis, we vary a certain parameter of the model. So on the left is the cup um, stabilization where we, for example, change the length of the pole. And we see if an algorithm that was trained for a certain length 0.5, which is the logical dash line, how well it does if we vary the length, right? And some, some approaches are better and worse. Um, and again, this is just to highlight you can do these type of comparisons. To, so to summarize, um, yeah, go to the link, the GitHub link and have a look. So the software rate framework, you know, has a gym interface relies on PyBullet, PyTorch, and Cassidy, has a YAML configuration system, and then the core util utilities are symbolic models that you can define for the environment. You can define constraints, and you can inject disturbances in a repeatable way. And then we have a number of baseline implementations, both traditional control approaches, traditional RL approaches, and safe, the encouraged versions um, that have been proposed by both fields over the last five years. So what is next? Yeah, we want to open this more um, of the state of the art controllers. Um, we also have a 3D quadrilateral environment that we aim to open source soon. And um, of course, we encourage everyone to use it and comp and, and make um, additions and um, report issues. And so we'll work on incorporating all the, the issues and addressing the issues that other people have. And one of the exciting next steps is we really want to also go from, use this platform to go from thin to real. So um, we have been working in my lab with um, the Crazy Fly platform. So the small open source software and hardware quadruple platforms. And um, we, have, we have a competition where we um, encourage teams to learn in simulation and then um, test the results in, on real hardware. So to really work also on the thing to real aspect. And so overall, we have done a lot of different efforts around safe robot learning. They all started kind of with our review paper. Um, we had a few different workshops and all the recordings are online. Um, the last one was at Neurex, I believe. Um, so if you are interested in the topic overall or other, um, other um, contributions in this area, check out the webpage saferobotlearning.org. There you see all the events that we have had over the past year, year and a half, and um, all the resources such as um, Safe Control Gym. And then upcoming, and to, to do a bit of advertisement, we have an IRIS workshop 2022, so this year, on Safe Robot Learning, a competition. 
so an IROS competition on safe robot learning. Um, the competition release will be this July. And then the competition will be in October um, during IROS. And the idea is really to use safe control gym to um, as a simulation environment for this competition, but then transfer your controllers on real crazy fly platforms in the lab in Toronto. And so that, that is our motivation both from the sim to real aspect to really see how simulation eventually can drive um, controllers in the real world. This is, a, this is not only an effort from our lab, but has multiple other um, co-organizers, including Nick Croy and Vijay Kuma, who's the chair here for this conference. So we are really excited to kind of push it in towards the next step and have a full open source software hardware test bed for Simtu Real. So everything with the crazy flies open source, so everybody could build their own or, or all of them online. So this, this was kind of a big overview of safe control gym. The goal is really to bring the controls and reinforcement learning communities together to build learning-based controllers that work on real robots. And so um, we'll have a bit of time left, I think. And maybe a little bit. minutes, 10 minutes, so it should be. Uh, maybe, okay, maybe we'll switch over to questions yeah. first. I think question first. And, and yeah. During the question, you can set up. Yeah, you can set up. Okay, you could live demo also the download and, and so on. So, but maybe we'll start with any, any questions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure this comparison really is relevant. I was like, I guess, in terms of like memory allocation, it was like the new controller, right? Just as soon as they come in, it's probably just pick up the memory, right? Yeah. Um, we haven't done, I think th this environment will help to support it. Yeah. It, it is very relevant, especially for resource constrained robot platforms such as the Crazy Fly. So I do think this is a, another kind of dimension of comparison that can be done. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what do you think is the biggest challenge you simulation? Yeah, I think for the simulators, right, one, one thing is that we wanted to go away from these virtual characters that have been used a lot in our realm um, towards more realistic scenarios. But being realistic and still kind of a simple enough environment to be used by many is, is the challenge, right? Um, you know, ideally you would kind of simulate all the sensor characteristics, etc., but then it becomes complicated. So I think the trade-off between simplicity and being so realistic is challenging. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I uh, missed this all. The, the model, uh, the her knowledge and the data of two different things. Was this only used to train or was it also used to operate? Are you asking if the prior model is used? It's just used to train or a okay. network, or is it actually used during the operation? So the prior model in these control based approaches is used also, I guess, during operation. So in the worst case, if your model is completely wrong, an approach like this to do it basically cancel out the prior model and learn kind of what's the new model, right? So it learns a model error. And so if the model is completely wrong, it would just learn a very big model error, but it would still use it, I guess. There's some online question. Mm -hmm. So the first one is, um, how do you encode a hard constraint under uncertainties, since it is possible that one uh, out of large number of cases to say, robot may behave out of expected uncertainties? Yeah, so these hard constraints, they make assumptions about boundedness of the disturbance. Yes. So it cannot be Gaussian. Where, like in the worst case, it could, in the very rare case, it could be an extremely large error or disturbance. So these approaches often make some assumptions about governance. Yeah. Okay. 
And there was another question is, would you say that learning based control is limited to only model based RL or does it also include model free RL? I mean, this is a bit of a terminology issue. <laughs> what, what, what do you call learning based control and what do you call reinforcement learning? I think that's, um, uh, yeah. But overall, I have to say all these approaches have not been demonstrated on extremely complex task systems. It would be super interesting. Yeah, yeah. I think overall, my research direction definitely goes in this direction. How can we? Because right now, again, this is a finding from our review, a survey paper, is that all the approaches assume they have a measurement of the full state possibly disturbed by Gaussian zero mean noise. Um, so that's obviously not very realistic. So going away from this is certainly something I think is really important for research and would need to be supported by this stuff. So, yeah. Well, um, yeah, well existing, yeah, existing um, state designation techniques could be incorporated into the dynamics part of this. Right. Yeah, so the state estimation would be on the, I, I think, would be included in the controller design, but it's something, yeah, if you are interested, I'm happy to chat a bit more because we are, yeah, this is something um, one or two of my PhD students are looking at. It, so, yeah, very relevant. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Um, thank you, Smitty. Um, so, one thing I've been thinking about recently is that a lot of RL problems assume episode recent. Where if the agent does something, you know, cracks an egg on the floor or something, um, that you know, ultimately that's fine because that's a reset. They get a negative penalty for that case. Um, so one thing I've like kind of started thinking about is like, is there a way to constrain the behavior of the robot to only do things that it or to prioritize behaviors that are invertible? So like it can maybe learn that dropping an egg on the floor isn't something it can easily undo. Um, yeah. Or maybe it eventually learns that it can, in fact, undo it by cleaning it up afterwards or something. Like, yeah. is, is this like, would be very helpful to have an episode or a reset free benchmark? <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I think this concept is definitely a concept very well studied in the controls community, control uh, often called reachability. Um, is it applicable to the practical example you mentioned? I don't think yet, right? It's much simpler, uh, or it can be only computed for much simpler problems. But the idea is there. And I think a lot of, I, of these relevant ideas have been discovered and studied in the controls community, just not necessarily for the complex robots we want to have in the future. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I, I think the reset is a, is a big issue. Also, any unsafe, ex if you can, Anything that during learning that makes the robot unsafe is also kind of lost training time because if you would have known ahead of time that this is unsafe, you should have not explored this and not have spent some time kind of gathering data from those scenarios. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes, I mean, I, I will take one question from here and then we go back to the audience. One question is Do you have, do you have implementation for all the control algorithm? Uh, this is the corresponding RL algorithm for comparison, or do you provide a way to compare where a user will plug the algorithm? Yeah, both. Right? So we have these baseline algorithms implemented. They are open source. You can you know, look into every detail and modify them if you want to. But then we hope that people use this environment for their own controller implementations and then, you know, for example, show that you're more data efficient or safer than other approaches. There was a more question, I think. We hope so, yeah, yeah. Um, but we also rely a bit on the community to help, or if someone is interested to add other models, we are very um, happy to support this. Um, yeah, I think. You know, an interest of mine is also interaction scenarios. I think this is also something that we saw in the review. Nobody really looks at this, especially.
especially not from the safety aspect. So yeah, interaction scenarios where the, the, the robot interacts with objects in the environment would be really interesting. Robot arms of course would be also interesting. So I have a question actually, I mean, I really like the talk on the safety concepts that you presented, but for instance, you showed the video of the drone that are uh, with safe off, right? And you make quite strong assumptions there on the functions regarding the RPHS norm, et cetera. Yeah. And the noise box is there. When you talk about real world deployment, these assumptions are not satisfied. So or it's difficult to show they're satisfied. What's your take on that as well? Yeah. Um, one is you have to start somewhere, right? Yes, uh, these assumptions are partially very strong, and a lot of the assumptions actually, almost every work that does give some guarantees makes some continuity assumptions that are not necessarily satisfied. So, continuity of the unknown model components. Um, uh, yeah, I think, you know, we, we aim to work towards less strict assumptions. I do think also one part that is completely overlooked is to check if these assumptions are actually true in practice. And we have some very theoretic machine learning work where we do some of this, but you do you can do that and can do that really well, especially with approaches like Gaussian processes, you could check in real operation if your assumptions are correct or not, and then adapt. And I think this is also something that is not done. Yeah, so I think the checking is one thing, like at least check if the assumptions are true as you operate. Um, the other one is find better arguments for more general setups. Then. Yeah, um, we, we work on this. <laughs> yeah, and ho hopefully more people work on this. <laughs> it's not easy. Thanks for that. Um, so we will have a five minute break during the break. Uh, they're going to demonstrate actually how to restart and use uh, uh, what, what was shown. And then we're coming back with uh, automatic hyperparameter tuning. And then later on, um, EGRX advanced usage with training a quadruped to turn in five minutes. So there is a break, but you can actually stay for the demo uh, on how to, to use. Okay. We don't want to get into your break. If you want to see a command line, and in the worst case, you can you will you can watch it back. Then uh, we will upload the replay also on YouTube. Yeah, so it's an installation procedure. I just did on uh, on Zoom. So for those Zoom or those who can watch the replay later, um, all the instruction on GitHub, and I just run them live uh, on the Zoom. Yeah. So your host. Yeah. Um, I'm just gonna run the scripts with a few of the example, few of the experiments. The results you have seen in the presentation. Show them that they're live, they're on, uh, they're on GitHub, and if you want to try them, if you want to try them to yourself, modify them, and uh, use them as a starting point for your experiments and research, we welcome that, would be nice, and that's why you're that's what and obviously, all our work is strongly based on having a small quality of work on that graphene and your comments. Terminal. Uh, so just I just pre-sold from scratch the new from the environment and the, the repo that was introduced by Angular. So these were the steps we just go and uh, them again. They're very simple and they're they're on GitHub. Just copy and paste them into your terminal and they should work. And now again, the end I'll just show you the initial PAD controller example of Angular in Pagula. If you're here this morning, you know it's Pagula because the squares, because the squares are blue. It's just a few trajectory examples. So part of the, what we added to the API gym is a bit more the a few interesting trajectories like square and let me skate on our reciprocal trajectory that was part of the environment so the agent can extract that information and uh, then figure out um, how to control that. So, 
is nine and it's big enough to create the So if you if you really have this morning you see the production of gym, you will be familiarized with the standard gym uh, troubles. We get an initial reset and then we start the environment. We give an action to the environment and then in return observation reward and attribution condition. What well, it's powerful in this terminal is what Angela was discussing. We extend the, the interface with essentially essentially symbolic representation of states and inputs, uh, dynamics, which may or may not be correct. We uh, may have a perfect representation of what goes into the by Google itself, uh, symbolic representation of constraints uh, and the uh, trajectory specifications. And then as the environment the environment sets, uh, we, we also get uh, the, the constraints population. And the constraints are typically the specified event to the young configuration of the system of the And the idea is for control theories, if people want to run these experiments and compare what in the work that's been published by other researchers, it would be easy to just produce the exact environment with the exact type of disturbances that they had or partial knowledge of the initial problem of the system. Uh, does your robust approach perform better to continue to mine with enough comparison? But we don't have comparison to exactly that's what the initial question is. Let me take just a few examples to show you that the figure of Angela was not a good skill for some of this. So this is one here, and This is modern predictive safety situations. So again, we have a cargo utilization task. But you're also trying to respect a uh, constraint on the mechanical uh, that's respect to the environment and uh, this experiment. The MPC agent that uh, corrects the input of the obviously pure it's most obvious vanilla pure agent figures out how to correct the and yeah, there's a few more, they're all on GitHub, you can run them yourself. 